It's finally time to rank the protagonists of Assassin's Creed from worst to best. Just some quick house cleaning first, obviously there will be spoilers for all the mainline AC titles. Also, it's okay to have different opinions than me. Please don't get upset if I place your favorite last or your least favorite first. We are all human and find different things appealing. Let's have a constructive discourse down in the comments section and explain to me why you think I'm correct or why I'm wrong. Okay, I think that's settled everyone down. Now let's ruffle some feathers. <coughs> Number 12. What can I say about Alexios? Ubisoft was terrified of committing to a female lead, so they tried their best to muddy the waters of what the Animus was capable of, so gamer boys didn't have to cry about playing as a woman while simultaneously screaming, look, you can play as a woman, we're not sexist like everyone says. Anyway, let's keep this short and sweet. He is poorly voice acted and not canon, so I just have no love for this character in the slightest. Malaka. Number 11. Yep, no surprises here. This guy is an idiot. A joke-quipping, running-gun, one-dimensional moron who has no respect for the creed or the mission. He just wants to start a gang and kill bad guys. Jacob is one of the Fry Twins of AC Syndicate. He never plans anything. He runs in and attempts to complete his kill without any consideration for the consequences of his actions. He isn't bothered by the people who get hurt or the problems he causes. He kills without a second thought, leaving his sister to clean up his mess. The entire game is a push and pull of Jacob breaking everything and Evie putting it back together. Jacob has almost no character growth except for this one arc, which the game I think could have expanded upon further. In this series of missions, Jacob starts to see the problems with his approach to being an assassin. He teams up with a madman named Roth, whom he shares an initial connection with as they both love just blindly charging into a situation and leaving chaos in their wake. I mean, it literally says so chaos in one of the mission descriptions. Eventually, Roth starts to get out of control as he tasks Jacob with blowing up one of Starek's workshops. Unbeknownst to Jacob, the factory is full of innocent slave children. Jacob runs in to stop it, but before he does, the factory explodes. Jacob then manages to save the children before realizing Roth must be taken out. This is a defining moment for Jacob as he realizes games can get people hurt. I just wish they had taken this further, but I do appreciate that he was heading in the right direction. Number 10. Eivor Varen's daughter is initially intriguing with her whole, oh yeah, female Eivor is canon, so I'll be referring to her as uh, that because, again, Ubisoft and female leads. What was I saying? Oh yeah. Eivor was initially intriguing because of the whole Odin talking to her thing and her relationship with her brother, but as the story drags on, you start to see how much more interesting everyone around her is and how she seems to lack any sort of major character development. Now you may argue that she manages to push Odin's consciousness out of her mind and become fully Eivor, unlike Basim who became almost fully Loki. But this isn't any character development at all. She never changed, she was the same the entire way through. And as Odin began to creep in, she pushed him away. It wasn't like she was a lot like Odin and then began to change and push him out. She was always as she is. There is no clearer marker of her unchanging ways than when she refuses to join the Hidden Ones after taking out the entire tree of the Order of Ancients. She learns nothing from her experience of hunting down these people and stands tall saying she doesn't like working in the shadows and wants to wear her accomplishments. A true Viking from beginning to end. Eivor, in my opinion, was voice acted fine, but some of the facial animations were really rough and it made it just a little bit harder to connect with her. Number 9. I think Shay is a very interesting character, but he wasn't given enough time to really shine. Rogue is a very short game, but in that time I do think he showed he was a good guy even after joining what we usually consider to be the bad guys, the Templars. However, in Rogue the roles seem to be reversed, the Achilles led assassins seem to have lost their way in this time period and are crazily running around causing earthquakes and whatnot. Shay goes through quite a bit of development in the short time we have with him. He goes from a cocky, self-assured assassin to a serious, goal-oriented Templar. Shay's biggest growth occurs when he is sent by the assassins to obtain an artifact from Lisbon. Once he finds this artifact, it disintegrates and triggers the Great Lisbon Earthquake of 1755, killing over 12,000 people. A similar thing happened in Haiti, and Shay is furious with his masters for asking him to do this mission, blaming himself and Achilles for the deaths of the people of Lisbon. Once Achilles refuses to accept blame or even acknowledge that they may have been in the wrong, Shay decides to leave and starts actively working against the assassins to prevent any more damage from being done and innocent lives lost. As he grows older, he becomes more mature. 
He has a goal and he's going to achieve it. I think the only thing letting Shay down other than the short campaign is that they basically reverse the roles of the Assassins and Templars, making the Assassins seem completely out of control and the Templars seem like the reasonable ones. This left no room for a nuanced change to the dark side that could have been much more interesting and that's what holds Shay back from being higher on this list. Basically, he moved from an unaware Templar to an Assassin with just the names reversed. That's what it feels like anyway, if that makes sense. If you're enjoying the video, why not hit that like button and subscribe if you're not already. That would be really appreciated. Quickly though, do it now because I think my next entry might make you leave the video immediately. Number 8. Okay, so here's where everyone closed the video. But before you get angry at me, let me explain, please. So my number 8 is Edward Kenway. Yes, yes, I know. Wait, 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 wait. Let me tell you why. Now, I have every reason to believe that if I replayed Black Flag right now, I would probably move Edward up the list a bit further. When I first played Black Flag, I was suffering from a bit of franchise fatigue. I had just played through AC1, the Ezio Trilogy, and AC3 before playing through this. Not to mention that before all of that, I had just completed the behemoth that is Valhalla. So I don't think that it is truly Edward's fault that he is this far down the list. But I will say this is the part of the list where I really start to genuinely like the protagonist from here on out. So Edward has a very well written arc. He slowly transitions from a pirate who wants nothing more than money and fame into a caring father who serves the brotherhood for the betterment of the world. I think why he's so far down this list is that I never fully connected with him the way that I should have at the time because I played so many Assassin's Creed games in a row. I should have liked his jokes and character, his charm and wit, but at the time I didn't really love it. Looking back and analysing the game as a whole, I can see why he is near the top of other lists. The tragedies that befall him, a lot of them caused by his own selfishness, mould him into a man and someone who is worthy of the title Assassin. So what I'm saying is he's probably further up the list, but for now I need to replay the game and explore that connection myself personally. Number 7 a lot of diehard fans might also think this is a bit outrageous, but Cassandra comes in next. Cassandra is voice acted leagues above Alexios and is much more charming and likeable, considering they have the same lines. I made a video talking about why I love and hate Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I will link it below. And in that video, I explored the problems I have with conversation choices along with consequential choices in AC games. Long story short, I don't like them. I think AC is much better off telling a linear story from history as it happened with the memories that are stored in the DNA. It makes much more sense this way and also leads to much better storytelling. All this is to say everyone's Cassandras would have been different. I chose to play mine as close to an assassin as possible. I made choices I thought related to the creed and therefore I tended to like my Cassandra. I just found her likeable and a good person. There are a few silly jokes that go way too far in this game, but for the most part, I liked the way Cassandra was handled in the main game. Let's just pretend that DLC never happened though. You could argue Cassandra can sleep with people and kill children and do whatever, but as I said, my Cassandra didn't, and I enjoyed following her along her path. Number 6 Ah, Evie Fry, another victim of the Ubisoft misogyny. Evie was sidelined in Syndicate to make way for her arrogant twin brother to the absolute detriment of this game. Evie is smart, professional, dedicated to the creed, and most important of all, a good person. Her relationships with characters were believable and she showed genuine care for everyone she worked with. Except for Lucy Thorne. Damn, she got messed up. Evie was constantly cleaning up her brother's mess and dreamed of liberating London from Starak's control. Some people may say she's boring, a stickler for the rules, but that's why I like her. She's like me in that way. If you set out a creed, then follow it. And she does. She is let down by the writing of her brother, but ultimately, that may even help her shine brighter standing next to that idiot. Evie makes mistakes, but she's always trying to fix them and help the people of London. Her gameplay is also much more in line with the older stealth games, and I enjoy it much more than the brawling of Jacob. I just wish she had more time to show us her development. I also like her willingness to do things she's uncomfortable with in order to accomplish her mission. Number 5 Connor Kinway is a Marmite kind of character. You either love him or hate him. I really tended to like him. His unwavering loyalty to his cause was an inspiration. He is naive until the end, but the fact that he is so willing to do anything and never give up should be a great lesson to us all. The Templars in this time period are a lot like the Templars from Rogue, as this game takes place not too long after that, with some of the same members still running the Templars. 
The Templars are more organized and seem to have a better grip on morals and how the world works than Connor, as we see this in conversations with Haytham. This dynamic between father and son is a very compelling part of why Connor is interesting to me. His father tries to teach him things for his own selfish reasons, never really caring about Connor, but Connor never relinquishes his supposed moral high ground. And Connor is wrong often, but that doesn't mean he's a bad character, it makes him more human. Physically, Connor goes on a massive transformation in the game. He is an absolute beast by the end of it, manhandling his enemies as if they were dolls. Mentally though, he never grows up much at all, which some would say is boring and terrible character writing, but in this case, I tend to disagree. Also, Connor does grow a little bit. If Ubisoft hadn't removed his speech from the end of the game, we would have seen that he does eventually learn to accept the world might not be as simple as he thinks it is. I'll leave a link to the speech in the description, as I think it's well worth a listen and adds a ton of depth to this misunderstood character. Number 4 Arno gets a bad rap for being a worse Ezio, but I don't think that's the case. To me, Arno is relatable. He has trauma that he covers with humor, tragedy that pushes him down but he always gets back up, and that girl he can never get out of his head and is constantly causing him trouble. Surely we can relate to that. Arno is never a true assassin. He joins the Brotherhood for personal gain, he never follows the rules, he isn't interested in the creed, but he does have good intentions. His mission is to find the killer of his stepfather. Arno has deep-rooted pain from losing his real father so young at the hands of the aforementioned Shay. When he loses his adopted father, partially because of his own mistakes, Arno spirals into a wave of depression and eventually ending up in jail with an assassin who helps him escape and he eventually joins the Brotherhood as a means to find his stepfather's killer. Arno is in love with Elise, his stepsister. Arno would do anything for Elise. Everyone's had that one person who always gets them into trouble, but we just couldn't let go of no matter how bad it got. Elise loves Arno too, but is nowhere near as committed as he is to her. She would sacrifice Arno in a second if it meant finding her father's killer. The twist here is that Elise and her father were actually Templars. This is a fascinating part of Arno's journey and character development, as he wrestles with his love for Elise, his allegiance to the assassins, and his lust for revenge. All in all, Arno is a far more complex character than people would see on the surface. He's not just a quick-witted joker like Jacob. He's not solely seeking revenge, ultimately above it all. He's just in love with a girl he can never have. Arno is also a very skilled assassin who is by far the flashiest parkour master, a skilled fighter and actually very good at stealth, as he has some of the best tools in the series. Number 3 now I've put Bayek and Aya together as although Aya is one of the best characters in all of Assassin's Creed, you barely play with her at all. So I'll firstly briefly touch on Aya. She is a wonderful character full of life and vibrancy. Unfortunately, the death of their son tears their lives apart. As Bayek and Aya seek revenge for their son's death, they slowly drift apart but never stop loving one another. Aya is a complex character who is very important to not only Bayek, but was a large part of the creation of the Hidden Ones. Damn Ubisoft, every time I talk about this, I feel sad for the Aya game we never got. Okay, although Aya was arguably a larger part of the creation of the Hidden Ones and their spread throughout the world, we mostly play as Bayek in AC Origins. Now I love Bayek, he is one of the best acted assassins with his beautiful line delivery. You can feel his pain, happiness, sorrow, and determination through every word. Sleep. I never sleep. I just wait. In the shadows, and I will kill you all! Everyone who sniffed the air that day in Siwa! Bayek is not only a loving partner, friend, and Medjai to all the people, but a fierce fighter who can be legendarily scary in battle. He fights with pure strength and an unfaltering will to succeed. I think it's Bayek's ability to be at both ends of the scale precisely when he needs to be that is my favorite part of him. He can be a friend to a little girl one second, while tearing the ever-living shit out of someone the next. Bayek just feels like a good person, and that's just something I love in a protagonist. Bayek goes through so much in his life, but his goals are always admirable. And out of the darkness, he and his wife start something positive, the Hidden Ones. A group of people who set out to free the world from tyranny. They set up a creed that has stood the test of time, as modern day assassins still use them today, even if they are not fully understood by each and every group of assassins throughout the years. Bayek is a perfect protagonist, and if not for the importance of the next protagonist, might be in second place. Number 2 
Altair ibn La Ahad is one of the most important and influential assassins that we have seen in game. He starts out as an arrogant, overconfident man who has no respect or care for the creed. Having been born into the assassins, he feels he is better than others and can do whatever he wants. We see him break every tenet of the creed in the opening minutes of the game. After being stripped of rank and gear, Altair must learn how to be an assassin again. Over the course of AC1, Altair grows slowly from a little boy he was into a headstrong man willing to do what it takes to protect the freedom of the people. As he takes down targets, he learns more and more and realizes his own errors, eventually killing his last target who reveals his master to be a traitor all along. Altair must confront his master now knowing him to be in control of the Apple of Eden. He fights through the control of the Apple showing how much he has grown as a person. Being able to fight the Apple's control is no small feat. Altair has a fantastic character arc. He doesn't just turn on a dime, he slowly but surely grows into a man he needs to be to rebuild the Assassin Order. Apart from the American accent, he's a pretty well acted character. In Revelations, we get to see later points in his life through the memories stored in the Marsyalf Keys. These are acted with a more authentic accent and are much better in that regard. The small snippets of his life we get to see are his most important. We see the death of his wife, him wrestling back control of the assassins, and him building the library. By the time Altair passes, he is a wise old man who rebuilt the order and regained its former strength from the ashes, to which Al Mu'alim and Abbas had burnt it to. Number 1 Ezio Auditore da Firenze Come on, you knew before clicking this video he would be number one. If you were hoping I may be different, then you were mistaken. We get to see Ezio from birth to death, a wonderful character who starts off as an innocent young teenager and matures into a wise master assassin worthy of his title. Ezio is the poster boy of this series for a reason. Not only did we get three games from different points in his life, we also got a short film to see the end of his life too. Ezio had half his family taken from him in an instant, and without hesitation took up his father's mantle and pursued the traitors of his brothers and father. Ezio is funny, charming, and a determined individual. In AC2, Ezio is easily frustrated and impulsive. By brotherhood, he has grown up a little bit and is more calm and collected. He plans his missions, but still retains his jovial love of woman. He's a ladies man through and through. By revelations, we find a very wise, strong, and perfect role model of a master assassin. Everyone looks to him for guidance and is an ideal leader of the assassins. He is brutal when he needs to be, but does not kill for the sake of it. He even lets this bag of dicks go once he has what he needs. Ezio is a lover and a fighter who dedicates his entire adult life to the Brotherhood. No one can replace this man as King of the Hill, and is one of my favorite characters in all of media. The Prophet, Master Assassin Ezio Auditore, is a special person who guided us through some amazing stories and I will never forget the feelings I had at the story ends of both AC2 and Revelations. Ezio is an excellent example of how to write characters and also shows us why having sequels or even trilogies rarely helps flesh out a character. And no, it's not the same as making a game 100 hours long because that did not work for Avil. Well, that's the list. I hope you enjoyed it. If you agreed or disagree, let's have a polite chat down in the comments section. Hit that like button, my friends. Let's help that algorithm find my channel. Thanks so much for watching. Thanks to the patrons. Sticks out.